Good morning to all participants and thank you for joining the legal aspects of preventive procedures and agency attributions of the TOT training course. My name is Achille Campagna and I'm a lawyer specializing in criminal law and fundamental rights uh, uh, and to a good extent journalism as I have the pleasure to defend a couple of journalists in my country. So basically, uh, today we will address two legal aspects mainly. The first one is freedom of speech, the fundamental right of freedom of speech, and uh, the fundamental right of private life. Uh, this is the first part, and uh, it has been developed around the Valtonic case. So I'll pose you a simple question at the beginning, because it all comes down to it. Why even bother? Why should we bother? Why should we let them speak? Why should we allow freedom of speech when we are dealing with such an important activity like countering terrorism? Why even bother? Why? Why? After all, we're, we're after something that protects national security. So it's not a, such a big sacrifice to uh, shut someone's mouth. I mean, uh, we're not asking them to stop eating or, or, or some uh, incredible uh, tough sacrifice. We're, we're asking them not to express their opinion, thoughts, not to think. So now, uh, should, we, should we allow freedom of speech when, uh, when dealing with counterterrorism? My answer is yes. I believe we should. I believe that, first of all, because there is no, no consensus and overall agreement as to the basics, as to the definition of terrorism itself. We are all uh, very positive and we agree, everybody of us agree, agrees that we should fight violence. I believe nobody disagrees about that. Violence, discrimination, hate, they should be fought. No doubt about that, no doubt about that. But when it comes to the broader concept of terrorism, well, when we think at the material conducts that could fit under that label, well, we're going to disagree a lot, especially now in the age of uh, agencies programming and counterterrorism undertaking, where a lot of new stuff has been fit inside, inside the terrorism concept. And we can see catch all offenses, and we can see acts uh, that are far removed from, from uh, violence or terroristic acts whatsoever, like glorification of terrorism, for example, humiliation of terrorism. So, on the one hand, we should allow public debate over what terrorism is. On the other hand, we should always keep in mind that when we try to constrain, limit freedom of speech, we are imposing an incredible sacrifice of fundamental rights. That's the most important fundamental rights when it comes to democracy. The, democrat the democratic order. Well, most of you are men of state, you represent the institutions, you may be public servants, you may be uh, you may agents, public officers, and so on. So um, you, might, you might find it a little bit strange to, to hear from me that uh, the, the, highest, the highest protection is deserved by the freedom of by the freedom of speech. The more uh, when we speak in public debates, 
when we criticize governments. The more we criticize government and, they, and their institutions and, uh, and public concerns, the more freedom of speech should be protected, safeguarded, allowed, and the less constraints might apply. So um, you should be prepared in your activity to face criticism, to face bashing, vehement critics, harsh judgments, and so on. Because there's no way to stop them. And it is not right to do that. It is not right to do that. I'm sorry, my friends, but you, you got to accept that. You got to accept it. But by the time you silence those voices, you are disrupting democracy. That's what is happening. What is happening. So now then, um, as I said, as I said, freedom of speech deserves a really high standing among fundamental rights. And, um, and they, they, they should never be, it should never be constrained. Um, but there are certain overriding needs that can, that can come before, before freedom of speech, not in its general meaning, but uh, under specific circumstances. In particular, uh, there should, there could be overriding needs, pressing social needs that deals with national security, with public order, and also the rights of others. The, the rights of others. Rights of others should never be construed as a too broad definition. It means the rights of those who can who can be endangered by violence and by hate speech and discrimination. Nothing more than that under a definition standpoint. Definition are one of the biggest concerns as set out by the special rapporteur for the promotion and protection of human rights while countering terrorism, uh, the special rapporteur of the United Nations. And I want to switch to the annual report that has been providing such a sort of inspiration for all my reasoning. Um, well, one of the one of the biggest concerns that uh, that emerges from uh, from the report is the lack of definitions. As long as I am talking about uh, overriding needs, pressing social needs that can form a constraint to freedom of speech, I am also setting out and recalling that any limitation must be designed in a very circumscribed, detailed manner, not to allow for discretion, arbitrariness, and ultimately abuse. The definition issue lies at the core of the problem of terrorism. Since long, after decades, we have no clear definition, even at the international level, of what terrorism is. So the risk is high that um, new, new uh, developments, new legal developments, emergencies, and, uh, and, uh, and the likes of provide for the, the, the so-called catch-all offenses offenses that are too broad to be defined they are undefined like uh, as i as i hold glorification of terrorism anything can fit into that humiliation of the victims of terrorism they they have big names but when when you when you take a look at what those those provisions set out well you might be surprised how much discretion they allow for. So basically, as the special rapporteur sets out, this is posing significant risks, posing significant, significant risks that might end up in content regulation. 
content regulation is the opposite of effective finding, investigation, and punishment of crime. We are not after, we are not after uh, those, those forms of incitement of violent terrorism or hate speech or, 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 or those inchoate crimes that can trigger terroristic acts under a, a significant, a reasonable, at least reasonable causal link. No, we are after the speech. We are punishing the speech, the contents. So we are prohibiting speech. It is not important under certain conceptions and activities that nowadays preventive uh, authorities undertake. I said it's not important for them sometimes to understand if there is a real likelihood that a terrorist act, terroristic act may be committed. No, they are simply looking at what a given form of speech is setting out its uttering and uh, prohibit it. That's what, they, that's what they are doing, which is in itself, it's an abuse of a fundamental right like freedom of speech. In order to avoid this, we should always, always care about a material link, a causal link between any utterance, any statement, any, any form of, uh, shall, we, shall we say, propaganda, and a significant risk that a terroristic act is, an, is on its way, is on its way, it's possibly, it's possibly in the making. So now then, how to understand whether this link exists or not, in essence, whether a violent act is likely to occur as a consequence of, shall we say, a speech. Well, it's much easier than, uh, than, we, may, than we might think. First of all, uh, we should recall, as the Special Rapporteur does, that there is, a, there is a provision in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 20, mandating the states to fight hate speech discrimination and uh, incitement to violence. But around such provision, a very thorough work has been done in order to identify those requirements. Uh, some form of punishment and some, uh, some uh, countermeasures must be taken upon. And these requirements have been set out in the Rabat Plan of Action, which I encourage you to read. And that consists, uh, as far as we are concerned, in, in a six-point test, setting out all the criteria that should be followed to assess whether the, co the so-called causal link exists, or whether uh, the concern, the incitement, the act of incitement to violence can be deemed sufficiently uh, dangerous, sufficiently um, capable of bringing about the terroristic act. One of the, one of the, one of those, um, one of those requirements as set out by the plan is the requirement uh, is the assessment of the context. So, for example, if we are talking about a former terroristic group that has ceased to be a threat to perform attacks since many years, I mean, a sufficient long time, not to be a reasonable risk anymore, then in that case, we should not constrain freedom of speech on the basis of being said uh, debate or discussion or statement, a terroristic act incitement. 
because there is no real threat. So we always have to establish a causal link before we can dare to constrain freedom of speech, which is under certain profiles the most important fundamental right when it comes to building democracy, as I already said. So now then, let's uh, switch. Let's switch to the um, to the overview of the Veltani case. Let me uh, view my slide. Share my slide with you. All right. So um, Beltanic was a Spanish rapper. He was born in a Catalan speaking region of Spain. And he has been convicted for the glorification of terrorism pursuant to Article 578 of the Penal Code of Spain, humiliation of victims of terrorism, other crimes, including insult to, to the crown. So once uh, his conviction became final, he flew to Belgium. By the way, the, 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 there's, there's history in this, as long as uh, uh, right at the beginning uh, uh, of, of one of the major legal instruments uh, setting forward provisions for the fight against terrorism in Europe was discussed in Belgium, in the city of Ghent, by the way, and there was a big rift among the Spanish and the Belgians. The earlier uh, for the hard line and the Belgians advocating for fundamental rights. So there's a, there's a lot of hist there's a lot of history in this. Now then, um, as I said, Valtonic flew to Belgium, um, but he, he turned himself in to Belgian authorities immediately. Uh, once, uh, once Spain filed a an European arrest warrant request on grounds uh, of Article Two, uh, that was rejected on grounds of Article Two, Paragraph Two, because of uh, of the lack of double criminality. So what's interesting is that the Ghent, Ghent first instance first instance uh, court rejected the EAW request from Spain because the offenses of um, glorification of terrorism and also humiliation of the victims um, not only were not um, satisfying the principle of double criminality but they would they 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 were not uh, even fulfilling uh, the meaning of terrorism as, as it should be construed when reading the list of crimes attached to the framework decision about the, EAW, the EAW. So to better explain, um, uh, when a country files a request for a European arrest warrant to another country, or they have double criminality, or if they don't, if they don't, I mean, if the, if the, if the offense is not punished in both countries, legal systems, then it must be some kind of an offense punished with a penalty of at least three, year, three years threshold, and, uh, and it should be included in the list in the list attached to the framework decision. So this list has, has a number of items, as you might uh, easily know. Um, and one of them is terrorism. So terrorism has been used by Spain uh, in order to seek um, delivery of Baltanic uh, based on the fact that their offenses of glorification of terrorism and humiliation of the victim of the victims of terrorism are indeed are indeed a form of terrorism but ghent instead in response held that terrorism um it's a as being a, a, a very broad uh, definition 
cannot be extended to something which is so removed, so far away from, from, from a violent act, uh, like, uh, as I said, glorification or humiliation of the victim. So that's interesting that they, they did not allow for such a stretch as the Spanish uh, would have liked. Then there is a three-year threshold problem, which is much more technical, and I don't want you to as participants to uh, lose too much time uh, on, on that one, but I'll easily explain as, as, uh, as this. So mm, when uh, Beltonic was convicted, um, he, the, the penalty was not punishable with a three-year penalty. This was the case later when Spain amended in 2015 their legislation and raised the penalty to the three-year threshold. So once they filed the arrest warrant, the penalty uh, had been heightened to three years. But it was not the case when Beltonic committed the crime. So ultimately, ultimately, this was another ground, uh, the request was rejected. And in as much as they filed an appeal against the first instance Ghent decision, um, the Court of Appeal uh, filed a preliminary request to the Court of Justice of the European Union. The Court of Justice um, provided their response on, uh, with the judgment on uh, March 3. But the judgment does not deal with the definition of terrorism, the um, possibility to include um, offenses like glorification or humiliation under, the, the, under that label. No, the, the, the judgment from the court by the Court of Justice of European Union only deals with the three-year threshold, holding that, that the three-year threshold to be taken into consideration when applying the framework decision is not the one enforced by the time the request is filed, but the one enforced at the time of crime commission. Let me close, um, let me close this case overview by saying that they also filed, Balton filed, filed a case before the European Court of Human Rights but the case was dismissed uh, uh, and it was declared inadmissible uh, and I don't have uh, any further information because sometimes uh, those decisions are not published uh, in, 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 the, in the European Court of Human Rights database. Sometimes they are one page responses in the easiest cases uh, that may, may occur for endless reasons. Uh, uh, honestly, I got some of them sometimes uh, myself as a lawyer while doing applications before the European Court of Human Rights. So once again, um, getting back to getting back and going uh, towards closure of my my remarks, uh, as we can see, as we can see. Uh, the first of uh, first before closing is just a small remark about proportionality. Uh, when it comes to Article Ten of European Court of Human Rights, um, and uh, also Article Nineteen of the Covenant, there's a strong emphasis on uh, proportionality. So many times states have been found found in violation of those articles because um, because of proportionality, because they applied penalties that way that were far too high um, with respect to 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 the infringement of the law that they 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 were connected to so basically um, let me recall uh, an important case which is stomaching against Russia where uh, 
statements uh, by this uh, editor of a newsletter uh, were considered as incitement to terrorism and violence, and this was uh, this was upheld by by the court by the court of Strasbourg. But as much as as much as the applicant suffered the penalty of five year imprisonment and three years and three year ban and a three year ban uh, as a journalist, well, this was considered too much. It was considered too much because higher penalties, prison, jail, which should always be avoided when dealing with freedom of speech, amounted to, to such a high penalty, such a, such, a, such a strong response that could trigger the so-called chilling effect on freedom of speech. So this is, uh, in one word, kind of killing democracy. When, when, uh, when people get convicted uh, for, uh, to sentences uh, in jail, well, we cannot pretend that everybody is a hero and, uh, and, and is available to go against uh, jail or, uh, or uh, I mean, uh, life-threatening life -threatening situations, uh, or, or at least, if not life-threatening, something disrupting disrupting someone's life in order to exercise their right to freedom of speech so basically there's a there's an important point to be made about the chilling effect of too high penalties in in the concerned case baltonic suffered a two year a two year penalty which is significant even though it is not our business to take a stand in favor or against uh, uh, what domestic judges are doing or not in in Spain or Belgium, but objectively speaking, two years, two years for for um, something that deals with freedom of speech must be really serious, must be very serious to deserve such a conviction. And once again, <clears throat> once again. Let's get back to, to, the point, to the main point, which is like once again, definition. Definition deals with the rule of law. And this is where we can find common ground with the next case that, there, that I'm going to discuss, which is Rotaru, and it's about uh, right, to, right to private life. Uh, that differently from Valtonic uh, has made it uh, up to the European Court of Human Rights, where a violation has been found uh, right under the accordance to the law limb of, of Article 8. When we deal with Article 10, freedom of speech, it changes, basically it changes nothing. And we, once again, might recall the words of a special rapporteur where she expresses their concerns about uh, about a poor definition poor definition allow for arbitrariness poor definition allow for discretion and ultimately under a technical standpoint they are they would not pass the, the so-called quality test of the law it is not enough for a law to exist in order for such measures to be lawfully taken when they form a limitation or a constraint to fundamental rights. Such law must instead be extremely precise, detailed, set out all the procedures, set out all the requirements for its application in such a manner as not to uh, to allow discretion. And once again, catch all offenses are not allowed. Now we will uh, close this session, this first part of the session, in order to switch to the second one, which is about, about the activity of intel agencies and data collection when countering terrorism. Thank you for your attention and uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave you 
to restart immediately. 